So since we're here in Pomona, nowhere near a river or a lake or the ocean, um, the ultimate heat sink has to be a cooling tower. So behind me then is the cooling tower here at the Spadra site. Um, this is a very typical wet cooling tower. Um, this one would be considered a counterflow mechanical draft cooling tower. Um, it's counterflow because the air direction and water direction are counter to each other. So in this particular device, air is actually drawn in through the sides where it's all open um, and then moves upwards and passes through what we call packing, which can also be filled. And we'll see that in a little more detail shortly. Um, this is all done under the influence of the fans. Um, you can see that there's two large fan housings up top. Unfortunately, for safety reasons, we're not allowed up there. Um, but there are two huge fans, each one about 14 foot diameter blades. Um, the air is then drawn in and upwards. And at the same time, the water then moves downwards. So let's just note that the water has picked up a lot of heat from the condenser where it's then gone through underground pipes. It comes all the way back. And now if you follow in this pipe right here and its twin on the other side, remember there's an A and B associated with this system. Um, this is where the warm cooling water would come back from the condenser. So the cooling water goes up to the top. Um, there's a distribution header up there. Um, so the water fills up that header, and then you can see if you get real close, there's numerous pipes. Um, those pipes then distribute the water into a very, very shallow reservoir or tray that's at the very top of the cooling tower. So the water fills up the tray, and then there's literally thousands of small diameter holes. The water drips down through the holes, and then as you get real close, you can see that it then drips through the packing. So this packing can also be called fill. This particular one is just called waveform packing. It's made out of plastic. Um, the water drips through the packing. Um, it creates a thin film of water on the packing. And at the same time, it drips. So it creates a significant amount of surface area. So the air moving upwards picks up the heat from the water moving downwards. Um, the water, as it moves downwards, um, will um, cool, right? It's giving up heat to the air. Um, then we have cool water that then collects here in the reservoir below. Now let's keep in mind that as the air is picking up heat from the water, it's also picking up moisture. Um, there's a significant amount of evaporation taking place um, in the water as it drips down through the cooling tower. Um, that evaporating water gets picked up by the airstream. Um, in fact, if you looked at the relative amounts of heat transfer, um, the heat transfer due to evaporation would easily represent 70, 80% of the total amount of heat transfer. Um, that's the latent heat transfer. The sensible heat transfer is heat transfer simply due to the temperature difference between the cooler air and the warmer water. So that's why we would typically use a wet cooling tower. If we had a dry cooling tower, which is where you would just have basically a big shell and tube heat exchanger, although it would be absolutely massive, um, it would have to be about five times larger than this just to accommodate the same amount of heat transfer. Now, that would be okay in an area where you don't have a good makeup water supply. Um, keep in mind that all that evaporated water goes into the atmosphere, so we have to have a large amount of makeup water um, that's going to, you know, make up for the evaporated water. Um, here in California, we seem to have plenty of fresh water, so pretty much nobody uses dry cooling towers. If we're out in the desert, however, um, then a dry cooling tower would make a certain amount of sense if we just don't have any water to make up for the evaporation. Now, continuing with the process, um, we have the cool water that collects in this reservoir. And I'm just going to walk up here a little bit. <coughs> um, you can actually stay there. Um, when the water collects in this reservoir, the first thing it's going to do is move through this chamber that I'm standing on top of through some screens. Um, in fact, here's a crank that we could use to lift and lower the screens. Without, the screens are going to filter out the big stuff. Um, things like bugs and Dorito bags and leaves and anything that might blow in. Uh, remember, this system is completely open to the atmosphere. Now, the semi-clean water is going to move across this way. And we've got, again, we've got three pumps like all the systems, each one at 50% capacity. So two are running at a time. Um, the pumps are actually submerged vertical pumps. They're actually sitting in the intake. Um, the motors for the pumps are directly above. Um, as the pumps energize the water, um, we're going to move. Um, we've got an expansion joint. Um, this right here is a huge basket filter. So that's going to be very similar to what you're going to have 
on any uh, swimming pool. Um, the water is going to come out of the basket filter. Um, you know, here's a valve that we may need to close in case we need to do maintenance on some of the equipment. And then the water goes down through each of these cooling water pipes um, underground, goes over to the condenser, picks up the heat, comes back, and as we started, it moves up these big vertical pipes and then into the little reservoir on top where the process begins all over again. So the other thing I wanted to show you on this side is the sodium hypochlorite tank, in other words, bleach. Um, this is basically a chemical addition system that's used to, you know, knock down any biological. So, you know, this system is going to sit in the environment, right? So um, you're going to get the possibility of algae and mold and anything else that might grow in the water. Um, so by adding just a small amount of sodium hypochlorite, um, that's going to keep all the biologicals from growing in the system. Um, another thing I would like to note is that the structure of the cooling tower, which is very common, is all wood. Now you might wonder, well, why wood? Wouldn't it rot away? Well, the answer is no. First of all, it's pressure treated. Um, but secondly, it's always going to be wet. It's going to be either underwater or wet because of the water dripping through the system. And when you have wet wood, it's never going to rot. So basically, the wooden structure should last forever as long as it's kept underwater. Now, it's not underwater anymore, and you can see that we're already beginning to get some rot on some of the structure here on the wood. And then one other thing to note, um, unfortunately, I can't see it in this one, but if you go up very high and right underneath the fan housings, what you would find is something called a drift eliminator. Um, when the air is moving upwards, um, contrary to the water moving downwards, there is going to be the possibility of some of that water actually forming a, a, a mist that is entrained in the airflow. Um, and that could actually represent about 3% of the total water flow in the system. Now, if you're talking about a system that is moving 3 million pounds per hour of water, you know, that theoretically means you could be losing 100 million pounds of water every hour just due to what's called drift. So at the very top, right at the inlet to the fans, <coughs> is what is called the drift eliminator. Um, basically, it's a tortuous path. Um, if you kind of look at um, the way this thing would work, um, you would have angled plastic or metal, um, kind of like this, angled, and you can have multiple sheets of that angled metal all underneath the fan. So as the air is moving upwards, the air being a gas, it's going to be able to navigate the bends and pass out through the top of the cooling tower without any trouble. The water, I'm not talking about the water vapor. I mean, that's evaporated. It's a vapor. It's gone. But the liquid water that's entrained, it can't make the turns, right? It's going to pick up a certain amount of momentum to one side. Um, and that water, after several turns, is going to tend to hit the inside surface of the drift eliminators and therefore just collect and drip right back down into the cooling tower so it's not lost. So you'll be able to turn your what could be a 3% water loss uh, down to about less than a tenth of a percent of water loss. You can't get rid of all the drift, uh, but you can certainly get rid of the vast majority of it.